So today, we'll be speaking with Dr. Jennifer Lerner, a professor of public policy and management at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government, on emotion and judgment. Dr. Lerner is a professor of public policy and management at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government, as well as the founder and former director of the Harvard Laboratory for Decision Science. This interdisciplinary laboratory, which she co-founded with two economists, draws primarily on psychology, economics, and neuroscience to study human judgment and decision making. Dr. Lerner publishes her research widely in scientific journals, summaries of which appear in popular print such as the New York Times, as well as broadcast media such as Good Morning America. She also serves on the editorial boards for the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology, Organizational Behavior and Human Decision Processes, and the Journal of Behavioral Decision Research. She's received numerous awards for her research, including the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers, and in a White House ceremony, the National Science Foundation and the President of the United States annually confer this award as the highest national honor for investigators in the early stages of promising research careers. So I now turn to our Experts in Emotion interview on Emotion and Judgment with Dr. Jennifer Lerner. So welcome, Jen. Thank you for speaking with us today. Thank you. So what I wanted to start out asking you was just a little bit about what first got you interested in emotion? Uh, where did it all begin for you? Okay. So I hadn't actually intended to study emotion. I was in graduate school and uh, I was working with Phil Tetlock as my advisor and I was mm -hmm. trying to study moral outrage. Really, I was interested in attitudes and judgment and decision making. We were looking at legal cases, trying to understand, um, you know, the psychology behind people's judgments. And we kept trying to prime moral outrage in the lab. And um, so we were writing all of these scenarios, various vignettes, giving them to subjects. And the pilot test came back with meager results. And nobody was outraged based on the things <laughs> that they were reading. Huh. And what I discovered is, is that they were too cognitive. And I went to see Bob Levinson, also on the faculty at Berkeley, mm -hmm. and I said, I can't get these people to be morally outraged. And he said, well, that's because you need to study emotion. <laughs> and um, unless you invoke emotion systems, they're not, you're not, not going to get a strong re response. Moral outrage uh, is in many ways viscerally mediated, and you've got to trigger these systems. So it was this huge awakening for me. And um, it turns out that while I was in grad school at Berkeley Psychology, it was um, you know just kind of a mecca. Uh, it still is. It's even more so for emotion research. And so I had wonderful intellectual resources, um, a lot of great advice, and that is how I started studying emotion. And then I realized emotion is what I wanted to study. <laughs> um, I just didn't know it. And there you were serendipitously in one of the most fantastic emotion research centers, you know, in the country. Yes. Fantastic. So Yes, Bob always gives people some of the best career advice possible. Um, I've been there too, and he helps okay. shape everyone towards emotion, which is great. Yes. So I wanted to then ask you about your research, which really has pioneered important discoveries in our understanding of emotion and how it relates to judgment. So you are widely known for developing this really exciting and novel framework to understand how and why emotions influence judgment and decision making, which you refer to as the appraisal tendency framework. And mm -hmm. I wondered if you could share a little bit about what you see as the core principles of this sure. framework. Sure. Mm -hmm. Well, um, the most important core principle is that specific emotions can be related to specific judgment and decision making outcomes in predictable, lawful ways. And the key to making those correct predictions is to understand it, the underlying structure of any given emotion. So um, most importantly, we've looked at the cognitive structure of different emotions. And what we've predicted and found is that the cognitive structure, um, in particular the appraisal structure, so some emotions are high in appraisals of certainty, for example, 
anger is a prime example of that. That sense of certainty associated with the active emotional state carries over and influences how individuals perceive new situations. So if I'm feeling angry, I'm going to perceive more of a sense of certainty in new situations. And we call that process the carryover of incidental emotion. I wondered if you could say a little bit more about this distinction between integral versus incidental influences on emotion in, in judgments. Sure. So um, we think of incidental emotion as something like I just described. Mm -hmm. You're driving into work, somebody cuts you off, dents your car, you're mad. Then you finally get into the office, you have a meeting that involves a question of whether you and your company are going to take a particular risk. So somebody hitting your car that morning should have no bearing on the decision for whether you're going to take this risk. But in fact, even though that emotion should be incidental to the meeting decision, it typically carries over and influences it. And in the case of anger, we know that when people are mad, even if the source of the anger should be normatively unrelated, um, it makes people more risk-taking. Mm. So you'd be more likely to take a risk in your company than if you were in a neutral state and certainly more likely than if you were in a fearful state because fear is associated with lack of certainty. So what this framework does is it allows us to link what's known about risk perception and risk taking, things like the role that certainty and controllability play with different emotional states. And then we can make much more accurate predictions now, you might predict the same thing in the case of integral emotion, and it might be a stronger effect. But let's say you were uh, driving to work, accident, you're mad. Then you have to make a decision about whether to change your insurance on your car. That would be an example of integral emotion. So the anger that you're feeling is normatively relevant. It's defensible as an influence on your decision regarding car insurance. So, so that's the difference. So interesting. I mean, it also makes me think of other work that you've done. Again, more seminal, important work looking at the relationship between emotion and economic judgments as well. And I wonder, you know, if you could say more here the ways in which emotions shape our sort of everyday, you know, purse strings, so to speak. Sure. Sure. Well, one of the things that I'm interested in doing is bringing a greater understanding of how emotion works in the brain mm -hmm. to um, expand our knowledge, but also uh, more specifically to solve common public policy program, um, problems. So one problem that we have is that people uh, um, don't value the future enough. So we don't, don't save enough in the present and we spend too much in the present. Um, and we also, when we have opportunities to get more um, later than um, we could get now, we don't like to delay that gratification. And so we just take less amount of a, a lower dollar amount today than we could take in the future if we were willing to eat. Um, this relates to some of the classic experiments done in psychology, like Michelle's marshmallow study, mm -hmm. where the kids are allowed to have more cookies if they can wait to eat them. Well, it turns out that adults do this same thing all the time. They don't wait to eat them. Um, and we do it with real money. And this is a problem in our national economy. And so we have discovered in our experiments that sadness actually increases this tendency. And um, sadness in general has very strong effects on how people spend their money. We always use real money and we use no deception and we follow all of the very well specified um, procedures in economics because we like our work to be relevant to economists as well as 
psychologist. And what we've shown across many studies, we now have three papers uh, dealing with sadness and economic decision making published in psychological science. Um, what we find is that sadness has what you would call irrational effects and it's incidental sadness and decision makers do not recognize the impact. Hmm. They, um, if you ask them, how is sadness influencing the prices you set or that sort of thing, they deny the influence of sadness. Wow. So we're very interested in this. And later this semester, I'll be going to the White House by invitation to meet with folks from the Council of Economic Advisors to the president and thinking about how basic understanding of emotion and economic decision making can help us to think about crafting some public policy interventions. That's fantastic. I mean, just hearing that this work can also have real world kind of, you know, policy level implications too. Yes. So my, my major career goal is to <laughs> learn more about mm -hmm. how the mind works, especially in the area of emotion and decision making and to make that information useful for the common good. Fantastic. And that's one of the reasons I work at a policy school rather than um, another place that I might work is because I like having the direct impact. I teach mm. military commanders, government officials from all over the world and get that information to them before they have to wait to read about it three years later. <laughs> Right, yes, the publishing scientific papers can take a while, as you know. So the last question I just wanted to ask, I mean, you touched on this already, but I mean, I want to touch a little bit more again about your work that's looked at the impact of emotions on judgment, including risk perception. Yes. And I wondered if you wanted to say anything else about the role of these distinct categories of emotions on, you know, the way in which it influences our perception of risks. Sure. Like so, fear or anger. Yeah. Sure. So fear and anger are both negative emotions. And when I came into the field, the standard prediction would be mm -hmm. because they're negative emotions, they mm -hmm. should trigger pessimism because a negative feeling leads to a negative global outlook. Um, but that did not seem right to me because the, of what I knew about the underlying structures. I mean, anger is an approach emotion. Fear is a withdrawal emotion. Um, anger is associated with a sense of certainty and individual control appraisals. When people are mad, they don't question themselves. And, you know, they really <laughs> think they know what's going on. Whereas fear is associated with them. It's a defined by a sense of uncertainty and lack of individual control. And those cognitive meta factors, control and certainty, we know, drive perceptions of risk. So um, along with Dacker Keltner, we predicted and found that fear and anger actually have opposite effects on risk perception, also on risk taking. And so this uh, is one of the most important findings that we, uh, we have in terms of supporting the framework and the need to look in a disaggregated way within emotional valence and separate out not all negative emotions have the same effects and not all positive emotions have the same effects. So it's really important to tease these apart if you want to make accurate predictions for judgment and decision-making outcomes. For example, we've done another set of studies that compares sadness with disgust. They're both negative emotions, but they have very different effects on buying price. Mm -hmm. Disgust suppresses buying price. Again, real money and sadness increases buying price. So there's a number of studies like that. In terms of the fear and anger, we have, um, that's another one where we've worked on some policy implications. We've done a nationwide field experiment where we randomly assigned people to different emotion conditions. And we've presented that work, <coughs> excuse me, at NATO headquarters and um, a variety of places around the world, um, also for the United Nations Training Institute, um, for various government workers who are trying to understand the psychological, biological, 
behavioral responses that people have to terrorism and threats and risk, that sort of thing. Right, so it sounds like this has really important implications for sort of the public communication mm -hmm. and perception of risk. Yeah, absolutely. We found that we can essentially shape people's policy preferences mm -hmm. and their perception of risk by randomly assigning them to one emotion condition versus another. Wow. Which is quite a, a sort of awesome and humbling thing to be able to do. Really powerful, too, that you can manipulate it, you know, that easily. Yes. So what I wanted to ask you a bit, I mean, it's been really interesting hearing sort of what got you into emotion, all the discoveries you've made in this realm of emotion and judgment and, and risk perception and decision making. And I wonder, you know, as you've made these discoveries, if you were to project sort of where the future of emotions headed, what, what, might, you, what might you say to that? Well, um, we are a relatively new field. And, um, you know, for most of the 20th century, it was pretty much dormant. You couldn't even buy um, Darwin's book and on uh, emotion. And people like Skinner sort of squashed the study of emotion. So one thing I would say is that we've made enough progress now that it won't disappear. <laughs> and <laughs> and um, so I would say, if anything, we're going to see more courses being offered at the universities. I think it's going to be very interdisciplinary. And um, what I hope is that the wheat from the chaff can be separated because so many people are now interested in emotion. There's a lot of kind of pop stuff going on and marketers making money um, <laughs> on emotion types of assessments that are not necessarily scientifically valid. So I guess I'm being negative here and telling you not so much what I think I'll, we'll see, but what I hope to not see. <laughs> and It's also important. Yeah, so um, those are some of my thoughts. I think it's telling, though, that a place like the Harvard Kennedy School of Government would hire an emotion researcher, you know, because in the past that was just considered to be sort of fluff. And now people are understanding there's a real um, science and the science is useful. So then the last question I want to ask you is a little bit related to the future insofar as I'm sure you have students come to you all the time asking you for advice. They're interested in emotion, considering whether or not they want to embark in this field. What do you tell them? Yeah, mm -hmm. so um, I tell them, great. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I often tell them, go to Berkeley. Um, or go to Carnegie Mellon, or go to UCLA, because those are the places where I got my training, and I'm so fortunate to have benefited from that training. I just had amazing mentors. And um, another thing I tell them is, don't rest on assumptions of what is kind of taken for granted in the field, you know. So when I came into the field, there were some very influential models about how valence of emotion predicted judgment or decision-making outcomes. And I didn't accept the assumptions of those models because it really didn't seem right to me the more I learned. And um, still, I think our research has a long way to go mm -hmm. in um, testing the hypotheses that flow from the framework. But uh, I think it's really important people have so many lay intuitions about emotion, um, to not rest on those lay intuitions and to not rest on even some of the assumptions in the academic literature about emotion. It is, it needs to be all of these things tested just as rigorously as if you were studying synapses. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and don't be kind of, um, you know, uh, sort of um, seduced into accepting some of the lay or even scientific intuitions. Well, I just want to say thank you so much for speaking with us today, Jen. It's been a real pleasure. It's been a pleasure for me. Thank you. So this concludes our Experts in Emotion interview with Dr. Jennifer Lerner from the Harvard Kennedy School of Government.